Well, it's Wednesday in the Word time, and I want to thank you for gathering together uh, around the Word of God so that we can uh, study the Scriptures. I'm telling you, God has given us light in a dark world, and we are definitely looking forward to coming to that light so that we can be in light. Uh, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 3.18 to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the Christian growth is not just something we do at certain stages of our life. It is a lifetime journey, and we grow through the Word of God. We grow through uh, exercise in our faith. We grow through worshiping the Lord. So God has given us everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness in Christ. Every believer should be walking in victory. Every believer should be moving forward in the things of God. We're here again. Thank you for joining me for this time for us to get in the word of God. We're going to pray and after we pray we're going to go right back into the book of wisdom and let the Lord continue to pour wisdom, his wisdom, on the inside of our hearts. Father we thank you today this is truly a day that you have granted us the grace to be able to experience. Uh, we thank you for the strength that you have provided us in this day, Father. It is because of your strength that we are strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. Thank you, Father, for the counsel of the Lord, the godly counsel, the advisors that you have given us in the earth, Father, so that we can be as iron sharpened and iron with one another, so that we can encourage one another, edify one another, Another, and even enlighten one another to what God you are speaking in the earth. Thank you for your favor that you have surrounded us with, Father. Thank you for the mercies of the Lord that are new every day in our life, God. You said in your word that we wake up to new mercies, so we thank you for the mercies that we woke up to this day, and we give you all the praise and glory. And Father, we thank you for the word of God. This word is life and health to all our flesh, and this word is powerful than any two-edged sword. And this word is going to the deep places of our lives, Father, and causing us to look more like Christ. Thank you for the transformational power that is taking place in our hearts and in our minds as a result of the living word. And now, Father, begin. Uh, we ask that you would speak to our hearts, speak in our minds, give us revelation knowledge, Father, that we may walk in the counsel of the Lord, the secret counsel. That's what you share with those who are in covenant with you. We thank you for giving us an understanding heart. We thank you for living faith, faith that is alive and active in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Well, we are continuing to minister on this course that we sense the Lord leading us in, and that is prospering through Proverbs in every arena of our life. We know that once we get the word of God in our heart, we have to know how to live that word out in a fallen world. And this is where the wisdom of God comes in. And God desire, us, desire for us to have this wisdom because in 1 Corinthians 1 and 30, he had allowed Jesus to be made unto us wisdom. So we have wisdom for the mere fact that we are born again, uh, we're in the family of God, but now that we're in Christ, we got to allow that wisdom to go and be poured into our heart, to, to meditate it, to get it in our heart, that we can live out the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, the New Living Translation reads like this, And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit. Now, with this new identity in Christ, we now have, we now have to learn how to uh, yield our wills and our emotions to the Word of God. We have to uh, begin to allow God's Word, God's uh, purpose and plan to become part of our desires, but yet at that point we have to be willing to make decisions. God didn't make us uh, some type of robot. We still get to make decisions and we got to decide how we're going to come in agreement with God, partner with the Word by yielding our will, yielding our emotions to the Word of God. Well, in Proverbs 15, take your Bibles and turn there. In Proverbs 15, Solomon now comes and provides wisdom instructions on right emotions and choosing the right way to live out our faith 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to uh, listen to uh, Solomon as he speak to us in areas of our lives in which we have to choose to release the power of God. That's what I meant when I said by willing to yield to that. A lot of times we as believers, uh, we know what the words say, but then we have to decide, am I going to yield to that? Am I going to yield to that power that God has promised on the inside of me as well as in his word? And so we have to learn how to yield to the power in order to walk in this wisdom instruction that God has given us. So Proverbs begins in chapter 15 by focusing on the power of our words. And in verse one through seven, we're going to see what wisdom has to say in regards to the power of our words. So often when we talk about or focus on our words, we have a tendency in the church to look at the negative sides of words and we neglect the ability that God has given us to use the right words, to use his word, to speak his word out of our mouth. The Bible says in Psalms 104 verse 24 that, that the world was framed or uh, established by the wisdom of God. In Hebrews 11 verse 3, the Bible says God created the world by his words. So words have the ability to do good. Words have the ability to create uh, 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 that which God is speaking. It has creative ability. And so I want to talk about how we can focus on the good side of our words. How our words can be filled with the anointing of God and great things can happen in our lives, in our families, in the earth, because believers know how to use their words. Well, it begins in verse number one. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And so we see that words can calm the negative emotions of others. Yes, the word soft means gentle or kind. Most conflicts go unresolved due to, first of all, a lack of words. People will not have the conversation. People have a tendency to try to avoid dealing with the situation because it requires what? It requires work. It requires vulnerability. It requires being open and transparent and being honest. So sometimes there is a lack of words. And because of a lack of words, what happened? Conflict remains. Life goes on, but there is some tension in the relationship. Why? Because somebody need to be willing to say, we need to use words in order to resolve this conflict. So sometimes there's a lack of words and then, then there are times where there are words but there are, there's a lack of love in the words. You, that sometimes there's a lack of words, but then when there are words, there's a time where there may be a lack of love in our words. So wisdom says kind responses to tense Tense situations or quarrels can diffuse the power of anger, both harsh words make that harsh words may cause. And so a lot of time when it comes to words, someone else could be upset, they could be angry, they could be in a state of hot temperedness, but you get to decide how you are going to respond. And Proverbs says, in a heated moment of another person's life, a cool word will calm things down. That's not easy to do, but if we want to walk in wisdom, we have to catch ourselves, we have to check ourselves. Okay, this person is acting... Uh, out a negative emotion. This person is acting out anger. How, God, do you want me to respond? And I am sure God will begin to speak to your heart and that there will be the love of God being able to shape the words and how you respond to that person. Now, you can't go back to that old upbringing. Oh, you're going to go off on me like that? You know, popping your hands and turning your neck and all that. No, no, we're not a snake. We're 
are saints. We are born of God. So we ain't got to get the neck all out there. Hallelujah. Well, let's go on. In verse two, he says, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. So words can influence toward good or evil. That's why when people are on an emotional negative high, it's sometimes best to avoid those individuals. Matter of fact, the Bible says, do not go to an angry man, lest you learn his ways. And sometimes you have to be careful because when people have anger or grudges in their heart and they got, <laughs> they, 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 they mad at the church and you go and you engage with these people, I'm telling you what, you're going to find out that that conversation, that conversation can affect your spirit. It can affect your attitude. It can cause you to begin, begin to look at uh, a person a certain way. And so we got to be careful because words can influence toward good and evil. And then when it influences toward evil, what happened? Foolishness comes out. Because that's what the Bible says. But the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. When people are acting like a fool, you don't want to listen to them. Because all that's going to come out of their mouth. And notice the scripture says it pours forth. It comes speedily. It comes, I mean, with a force. It comes like, you know, a water stream. You turn it on and water just glush out. And that's how it is when a fool begin to open their mouth and allow foolishness to go to come out. Well, verse three says the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. God is the witness of our words. The word watch suggests that God's presence is there. Our God is omniscient. He is all knowing and he is omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times. And so God sees the action of words that are used in an evil way or that people are using words to create good or evil actions and that's why we don't have to worry about you know what I'm uh, 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 people doing things and saying things everything we do is under the eye, eyes of God God sees everything his presence is there in verse 4 says this a wholesome tongue is a tree of life but perverseness in it breaks the spirit so words can bring emotional healing when they are kind and confident. The tree of life is a source of life. Perverseness is false speech or lying, which causes despair and leads to ruin. I was uh, listening the other day, a particular young man was really talking to a particular lady in a very harsh and a, oh man, you talking about uh, emotional abuse those words were so abusive and he didn't know I was hearing what he was saying so when I uh, began to talk with him and I confronted him about those words and he couldn't deny it because I told him I heard the conversation and, and, and then I began to get on him because I knew that was not his character but he was angry and he was upset. And then I told him, you're going to have to find a better way to channel that negative emotion because verbal abuse is just as damaging as physical abuse. And so here the Bible tells us words can, can bring healing to emotions. Amen. Word can bring encouragement. Word can, words can build people up. And we that are walking in wisdom, we want to learn how to use those words so that what we can bring, we can bring emotional healing. We can bring what? Emotional encouragement. I'm telling you, some people came from environments in which they were reared where words were just used in a foolish way, where it just came out and, man, they were beat up with words. They were put down with words. I mean, their self-esteem, their self-worth, their sense of value, all that was destroyed because of the words that came through the environment while they were being nurtured. That was a very precious and, and, and important time in that person's life, in that environment. But thank God when we get born again, I believe the Holy Ghost come and I believe he brings deliverance and I believe he brings us deliverance from the past bondages in our life. So we have no excuse to go around and say, well, you know, I was raised like this and you don't know the stuff that I came up in. Well, if you were born again, if you get the word of God in you, you got a new spirit in you now. 
You got the spirit of the living God. You got the word of God. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You are native born. Hallelujah. Just like your sins are, are blotted out, that old man has been crucified with Christ. And you are a new creation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, verse 5 says, A fool despises his father's instruction, but he who receives correction is prudent. Words can be rejected. You see, to receive instruction is to accept or follow and obey the correction given by the Father. When Solomon writes these Proverbs, he writes it from the position of a father giving instruction in, uh, unto his young children. And so here, God uses this to give instruction unto his children in the body of Christ. The word prudent means to be wise, intelligent, are successful and that's what God has called us to be in the earth we're not to be uh, ignorant we're to be wise we're to be spiritually equipped we're to be spiritually informed we're to be spiritually in light we're able to have a uh, call to have spiritual discernment that's why we don't move hastily and run you know as the world run but we learn how to wait on God we learn how to say let me pray about this and I mean genuinely pray about it don't just use that as an excuse to do nothing, but bathe that thing in prayer. Why? God is watching your heart, and God sees when you are literally sincere in wanting to have his wisdom in that situation, so you are genuinely praying about the matter. It goes on in verse 6. In the house of the righteous, there is much treasure, but in the revenue of the wicked is trouble. Lasting prosperity is not in what a person have, but who they are in their moral character and diligence. However, the wicked is troubled by their own wealth. Listen, listen, we live in a very materialistic age. And sad to say, the church has bought into that God of money in some cases and, they, and have allowed that spirit to come in the church. But thank God for men and women of God that's full of faith, full of wisdom, and of the Holy Spirit. They are speaking against that spirit. God don't, get this, God don't need you to go after the spirit of greed in order to walk in the blessings and favor of God. God don't need you to think that the gospel is a gospel to get you material prosperity in order to breast your bread, bread and water and keep sickness out of your midst. All we have to do is seek the kingdom of God first. We get our priorities right. When our priorities are right according to the word of God, God adds things to our life. He created this earth. He created all these things in the world so that we can enjoy. But God don't want us to make those things God's and make those things and exalt them above God, above love, above uh, humility, above uh, working together in unity and all those things. Sometimes people are fighting for stuff, but they are not fighting for the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace within the fellowship within the church. Verse seven said, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the fool does not the, but the heart of the fool does not do so so words have the ability to promote or spread in a manner that empowers others for good but a fool's heart cannot use words in this manner that's why I said we don't realize the power of words we can what I'm doing now is I'm spreading the gospel through words I'm speaking the kingdom of God through words so that word that I'm speaking out by mouth, it is promoting God's agenda in the earth. It is empowering you in your faith. It is building you up in the things of God. It is causing you to become God-minded, spiritually minded. This word that I'm speaking is not so that you can go and conform to this world, but that you and I can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Then we will know how to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service according to Romans 12, 1 and 2. 
That's what the word of God is designed to do. God didn't send a word, a living word, a word of power to cater to the carnal nature. He sent that word what? To be able to discipline and bring under that carnal nature that the nature of God, that divine nature may rule in our hearts and in our minds. And so we see here the power of words. Not only is there power in words, but there's power in God's love. And that's what wisdom brings out in verse 89. It reads like this. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him who follows righteousness. One way in which we experience God's love is through our worship. So here Solomon reflects on the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. You see, God does not respond to the offering of the wicked. And that's how people are. They think because I went through this ritual, and, you know, and I carried out this particular act and everything. No, God looks at the heart. And we have wicked people today uh, joining in to get this now religious activity and they think that uh, 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 is acceptable to God. The Bible says God does not accept. He said, matter of fact, he said it is an abomination in his sight. Oh, God said there are things in the Bible that's an abomination in his sight. He talked about that uh, uh, when it comes uh, to the sacrifice of the wicked, the, 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 get this, the worship of the wicked, he said, that's an abomination in my sight. Now, that's the word of God. There are things that when it happens in the earth, oh, God just don't sit there and smile. It, that, that behavior gets God's attention in a way of, of, of God responding in a manner that we don't want him to respond because his judgment comes. Well, let's go on. And the Bible says in verse 9, uh, the way here makes reference to the life, conduct, or lifestyle of the wicked. Oh, but isn't it great to know that the prayer of the upright is God's delight? Oh, you know when believers are praying, and I'm not talking about religiously praying, because the Pharisees had a lot of praying going on. They would go in the temple so many uh, times, uh, you know, a, a particular day, the hour of prayer. But those prayers were not heard. Those prayers didn't bring no power on the scene. So just because people pray doesn't mean God answered. But the Bible says the prayer of the upright, those who are upright, those who are righteous, those who are, are, are walking in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, God longed for us to come and pray. That's why when we see what's going on in our world today, what's going on in politics, what's going on in, in the government, Christians should not be drawn into that chaos. Christians should not be drawn into that division. Christians should not be drawn into that hostility and that hatred and that anger and that violence. We ought to do what? We ought to do what 2 Chronicles seven fourteen tells us, to begin to humble ourselves, turn from our evil ways and do what? Seek the face of God and pray for the healing of our our nation for the healing of our land that righteousness can be exalted in our nation and so there's the power of our words there's the power of God's love then there's the power of consequences and that's what uh, wisdom speaks in verses 10 through 19 in verse 10 it says this harsh discipline is for him who forsakes the way and he who hates correction will die to depart from the way of wisdom comes with a severe discipline, a severe correction, a severe rebuke or punishment, even to the point whereby the rebellious can experience death. Verse 11 says, hell and destruction are before the Lord. So how much more of the hearts of the sons of men? Now, if God can gaze into the dark mystery of the world of the dead, he can certainly see the human heart. That's why, saints, we need to be so transparent with God. We need to be so open in our prayer to God. I mean, God, we should, oh, the Bible tells us in John 15 that God calls us his friend. Yes, we're friends of God. 
and friends on that level share the deep intimate things of their life in a very safe and trusting environment. Because when people really become very open and transparent and they tell things about their life that uh, not on the front stage, but on the back stage, you got that kind of life that we all live. We have a public life and we have a private life. But when you have a friend, you allow the friend to come on the backstage of your life and you share things because you, you know you're in an environment where you can trust this person. And so what? Transparency is very uh, uh, normal in that environment. Well, how much more? God is our friend. And we can express to him the things that we're struggling with. We can express to him those things we're wrestling with that get this. Those in the public arena never get to know. But God knows because what? He sees our heart. And man, I'm telling you, when you have that kind of relationship with God, there is nothing that you can hold or uh, will hold back in sharing your heart with the God who loves and cares for you. Well, verse 12 says this, a scoffer does not love one who corrects him, nor will he go to the wise. Have you ever had that experience? A scoffer, a, a, a scoffer, a mocker, a one who sneers their nose at God and his word, and all of a sudden you correct them, then they get an attitude toward you. Hallelujah. Sometimes your own children will do that to you. Sometimes family members will do that to you. So what you should do, stop correcting? No, no. You continue to correct. You continue to love. You continue to pray for them. Because get this, a scoffer is really uh, uh, rejecting God. They're rejecting the word of God. They're rejecting spiritual truth. They're rejecting the wisdom of God. And I'm telling you what, when wisdom is speaking, we should listen. And right now, wisdom is speaking. Man, when wisdom is talking, I have learned I want to hear the voice of wisdom. Sometimes people say, you know, I just want to go and sit down at the feet of certain certain person. And, you know, it could be somebody famous. Well, if they're not born again and filled with the knowledge of God, you know, and don't have the wisdom of God, I don't know how a Christian can get so much out of that. Yeah, you know, but I think, man, I love to listen to someone that's got the wisdom of God and, and they're speaking the wisdom of God and they're giving me uh, insight into the wisdom of God. Oh, man, those are the type of ears you want to really listen to. Why? Because that is the wisdom of the almighty God. Verse 13 says, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. You see, joy affects the countenance. This pain is emotional and causes depression and sadness of the heart. And that's why we want to make sure that we have what? We have a joyful heart, heart. We have the joy of the Lord in our heart. We have God's strength on the inside of our heart. Why? It'll show up on your face. You ever hear somebody look at you and say, what's wrong with you? I know we're wearing masks now. A lot of people can't see people full countenance. Uh, I'm, I am you know, growing up, you know, my mom would uh, deal with us. And, and sometimes she would say, uh, take that look off your face. And I wonder what kind of look that was. I never figured out what that looked all I knew it was fear because why wow, I'm getting ready to get a spanking I'm getting ready to get disciplined or uh, get this I already got a spanking and, and 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 now what my countenance is wearing it and I'm sitting there you know in my face all this and that and she'll just look at me boy if you don't get that look and I got that look off I don't know what that look was, but whatever look was on my face, I changed. You did the same thing. You got that look off your face. But these children today, oh man, I tell you what, they'll put a look on their face. They, I mean, they'll do all kinds of things. But thank God that we came under a system where, get this, we knew who had the authority in the home. And I want to say this to Christian parents. You don't never give up your authority in the home. Because you got God backing you, even if the state don't back you, even if the government don't back you, you got the government of heaven backing you when you take your rightful place and exercise the authority that God has given you as a parent. And that doesn't mean you abuse nobody, but you stand on the authority that God has given you and you let God be the one who represent you as you exercise your authority. Well, let's move on. Verse number 14 says, the heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge. 
but the mouth of fools feed on foolishness. You see, insight motivates the heart of the wise to keep learning. The Bible even said that a wise man or a wise woman will learn and keep learning. Let me say some of those of us who are getting older in life. Don't ever think you've learned enough. No, you keep learning. You keep exercising that muscle in your brain. You keep doing something that's going to cause you to have to be stretched a little and challenged a little in your cognitive thinking. Something that's going to cause you to have to use your mind. Hallelujah. Keep that mind active. Get involved in things and, and do things perhaps you never uh, had an opportunity. Get your bucket list out. Hallelujah. Your bucket list don't have to be always going somewhere. It could be taking up a hobby or doing something or learning a particular a musical instrument or whatever, uh, this could be a time that you can find something that you're going to apply your mind so that you can keep learning. What's that? That's wisdom. Wisdom. But fools are motivated by foolishness, senselessness, and stupidity. Man, I tell you what, when you see somebody living like a fool, uh, you need to be honest with them. You say that, you, 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 that behavior is foolish. And if the, if the behavior is foolish, that means it's coming from the source of a fool. Therefore, you are acting like a fool. You get this, you are acting stupid. And so sometimes people think when you use words like that, you're putting them down. You're identifying that behavior because people need to wake up. You don't need to keep living foolishly. God don't, God don't recommend us to live foolishly. All that's going to lead to what? It's going to lead to destruction. It's going to lead to pain. It's going to lead to uh, us not being able to live out our days in some cases. And so this is, this is serious life living, and we have to be willing to be open and honest with people when we see that behavior based on Proverbs, as we're studying this wisdom, you, I mean, when you're looking at some of this stuff, as it make a contrast between wisdom and the fool, and while you're looking at the fool, you'll be, uh, somebody's name probably coming up in your mind. Oh, that's so-and-so. Oh, oh, that's my cousin. Oh, that's my niece. That's my nephew. Oh, that's my brother. That's my sister. I, I, I'm just saying, because what? Foolish behavior is in front of us. And based on the word, God reveals what it looks like. And God is telling the fool, stop living foolishly. Stop making unwise decisions. Stop resisting wisdom. Stop sneering your nose up in contempt toward God. Stop saying you don't want anything to do with God. Without God, we can't even exist. We need him, hallelujah. Well, let's go on. Verse 15 and verse 16 says this. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he who is of merry heart has a continual feast. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. You see, poor people can have a difficult life. However, being poor with a cheerful heart while poor can be a continual feast regardless of what your circumstances may be. You know, there was some teaching that came through the church with that uh, polluted prosperity gospel, a greed gospel, making people feel that anytime you, you know, you were poor. I mean, may I just look bad on the poor. God, when God speaks of the poor in the Bible, he speaks of ways of making sure that there are laws established so that the poor can be protected, so that people won't take advantage of the poor. And everything. And but when we look at the poor, we have a tendency what? To judge them and look down upon them. And so a poor person can have the joy of the Lord in their heart. And then he goes on in verse 16 and he said this having little with a heart that seeks to honor God is better than having an abundance with great confusion, turmoil, and panic. Yes, got a great feast, but get this there's no joy. There's no, there's no cheerfulness. Right in the midst of the feast is trouble. All right, verse 17 says, Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted calf with hatred. Where people love each other, a plate of vegetables without meat is better than a lavish meal where hatred dwells. A fatted calf represents a luxurious meal. I was talking to someone the other day, they're in their 80s, and they were sharing how they remember growing up where, you know, when they got ready to eat, you know, very seldom did they have meat. 
And, and some of us know about that, where we got that, what we call the bean pot, and had that big piece of bone. It wasn't meat, but it was a bone, I reckon, to give the beans flavor. And boy, we enjoyed those meals. We didn't sit there complaining, where's the beef? <laughs> you know? Uh, so, so, so a lot of time, we have to begin to look at life from a different perspective. Sometimes you look at people, they got all of this luxury around them. They got all, oh man, they live in the lifestyle. But man, inside their house, there's chaos. There's confusion. There's hatred. But then somebody may not have all that, but in their house, they got love at that table. They got people just happy and, and people who just, uh, uh, they just appreciate one another and everything. Rather at the table, everybody mad at everybody trying to eat. <laughs> Glory to God. Well, let's go on. Verse 18 says, a wrathful man, a wrathful man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger, alas, contention. A person easily angered or quick tempered stirs up strife and causes arguments in disputes. Listen, Christian, we that have the Holy Spirit, as I said before, we should not have no issues with anger management. We should be willing to submit ourselves to God. We should be asking the Holy Spirit to help us, but we should not be the ones going around throwing pots and pans and glasses and cutting up cars and keying cars and busting windows all because we are mad. And it's sad how people get mad and start tearing up stuff in the house. The next week you see them at Lowe's or Home Depot, you know, they're in there trying to buy what they tore up. <laughs> you got to get a handle on yourself. That's a negative emotion. You can't be tearing up the house, trying to, I, I reckon, scare everybody or whatever the case may be. I'm being a little humorous, but I've seen that where people have, you know, done some stuff and, you know, got mad at the person and, you know, went and beat the car up and next thing they got to pay to get the car repaired. You don't have to do that. <laughs> Let's go on. Let's go on. Verse 19 said, the way of the lazy man is like a hedge of thorns, but the way of the upright is a highway. You know, a lazy person find, <laughs> find obstacles in everything they do. They always got an excuse, you know. Well, I didn't go to work today. Well, my car wasn't crank. I oh, They make excuses to be lazy. And sometimes people have a tendency to listen to those, <laughs> those excuses. I'm telling you what, you know, uh, you know, if I see a lazy female, uh, you know, that, 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 you can kind of tolerate that a little bit. Hopefully she'll get herself together. But, but I can't deal with a lazy boy. I can't deal with a lazy man. Oh, that stuff just bothers me. And sometimes when you're dealing with a lazy guy and everything you try to deal with him, they think you're being hard on him. They think you're being hard on And then family members may think, well, why you got to be so hard on It's hard to deal with a lazy boy. Yeah, because that boy, what? That boy going to be a man one day. He going to have to take care of family. He going to have to be responsible. So when, you, when do you learn to do that? Boy, you learn to do When I grew up, you learned how to do that at five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What? You learn responsibility. You didn't go around there, people talking about, well, that's the baby in the family. You know he going to get away everything. <laughs> well, my mom had nine children so nobody was the baby for a long time <laughs> but I'm telling you when we grow up we got to realize we got to make sure that we raise children to be responsible in life and the reason you want them to be responsible is not that you're trying to be hard and mean and all that because see you're not promised to be here forever Yes, you're not promised to be here forever. And the best thing you can do is to be able to empower them that if something happened to you, they can be what? They can pick up life and they can go on and continue life and not feel like I can't make it in life now because why? Because I'm not a responsible person. Well, let's go on then. And verse number 20 uh, talks about the power of good sense. There's power uh, of words, there's power of God's love, there's power of confidence, I, I, I mean of consequences, but there's power of in good sense and in verse number 20 it says a wise son makes a father glad but a foolish man despises his mother a wise son is a person who loves wisdom and practices it and his parents are uh, 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 is excited about him or her why they're walking in wisdom in verse number 21 folly is joy to him who is destitute of discernment but a man of understanding walks uprightly foolishness is a joy to him who has foolishness is a joy to him who has no sense yes Yes, if you don't have no sense, uh, you know, foolishness is something you just go for. Oh, but when you got good sense, you don't go for foolishness. 
In verse 22, we have five minutes. Without counsel, plans go airy, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Good listening is acted on good advice and suggestion. You need good counselors in your life. You need good people that's going to give you godly counsel. That's what Proverbs 1, I mean, Psalms 1 and 1 say, do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. So we need godly counselors in our life. Well, verse number 23 says, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. In other words, uh, joy comes when we give good answers and encouragement. And when we are saying, that's why it's important to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. When you are uh, talking with someone, when you're encouraging someone, you want to be what? You want to be God's conduit. You want to give the wisdom. You don't want to be like Job's friends. Oh man, Job's going through all that stuff and all they did was sit there. While they were quiet, they were doing good. But when they opened their mouth and God dealt with them too, for what? For that discouragement, for that judgment that they spoke and said, God said it. I'm telling you, you got to be watch out for people when they talk about God said and everything they saying is negative and about doom and gloom and making you feel condemned. You got to check that. God ain't speaking like that. Hallelujah. God wants to encourage you and build you up and get you out of that state of sorrow and pain. Verse 24 said, the way of life, uh, the way of life winds up for the wise that he may turn away from hell below. Wisdom calls us to live upwardly and not downwardly toward hell. Verse 25, the Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the boundary of the widow. The proud is the evil one. And you know what? God protects widows. He look out for those who are vulnerable in our world today. And in verse 26 it says the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant. Here's that word abomination again. Yes, now God is saying the very thoughts. Why? Because thoughts create actions. And the very God, and get this, God knows the thoughts. Hallelujah. Some people think God just saw what they did. God knows the thought. And he said the thoughts of the wicked is about, but the words of the pure are pleasant. And saints, God wants his people to speak the word of God. Speak words that build and that edify. Verse 27. He who is greedy for gain trouble his own house, but he who hates bribes will live. You know, people do anything to get money and they'll go out and get it uh, dishonestly and do what? And bring trouble into their family, bring trouble into their home. But he who hates bribes, he do that compromise. A person who won't go for any of the thing every time somebody offer them some how they can get some you got to wait on you got to check that thing out you don't want to go for a bribe verse 28 say the heart of the righteous studies how to answer but the white the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil when people are righteous what they do they take time to meditate and ponder before they respond but people that are wicked what they say when well, first thing come to their mind just pour it out Verse 29, the Lord is, Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the right. God is looking for the righteous to come to him in prayer. But he's far from the wicked. I don't know about you, but I thank God I've been made righteous through Jesus. So he got Jesus have given us access into the Holy of Holies. Oh, man, thank God we get to go in the throne room of God. Anytime we want to go in the throne room, we can go in the throne room through Jesus Christ. All right. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart and a good report makes the bones healthy. You know, when you hear good news, it encourages you. And when the eyes are reflected on the joy of the Lord, it encourages the heart. Good news calls psychological health. Hallelujah. Thank God for good news. The ear of, of uh, verse 31 says, the ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. Those who are open to correction, they're going to have wisdom. They're going to, uh, those who have teachable hearts, they're going to have the wisdom of God. Uh, verse 32 says, he who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebukes get understanding. Thank God for having a, a, a mind and a heart that know how to receive correction. And people who resist correction, who resist instruction, who turn away from instruct, turn away from wisdom. I mean, no, they are, they are despising their own soul. They are hurting themselves. And verse thirty three say, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. The fear of the Lord is to instruct. So when we begin to reverence God, when we honor God, we are fearing God. And the Bible said that's the that's the beginning of, of, of instruction. And before honor is humility. Sometimes people don't recognize their promotion is in their humility. Yes, 
humbling yourself. We grew up in a culture where people, I'm going to be nobody, do a man, I'm going to all this stuff. Like, no, no, no. The Bible says there are times you can give place to wrath. Why? So that vengeance of God can manifest. Yes. So that God can avenge you because God is a righteous judge. And there are times you're just going to have to humble yourself in situations. If you're in a place where there's established order and authority and those authorities don't seem to be uh, treating you right. You don't want to fight with the arm of flesh. James uh, chapter 5 verse 13 says if anybody's being ill treated, let them pray. Yeah, you got to begin to pray. And you pray and watch how God moves through your prayers. And you walk in love and watch how God, I'm telling you, God will cause you to receive honor right there because you are humbling yourself before him. Well, we're going to stop right there. I have three faith questions, uh, action questions. One of them, how can you begin to reap a good harvest from your words and use words to diffuse the negative words of others? Maybe you're facing something right now and wisdom is speaking to you. I want you to begin to change how you speak in that back in that situation. I want you to change how you've been responding to that person. And then uh, uh, wisdom may be telling you, I want you to begin to sow some good seeds with your words. I want you to intentionally be an encourager. I'm not talking about somebody going around being a fake and a phony and saying things that ain't in your heart but if you practice speaking positive encouraging things it's going to become part of your nature it's going to be part of your heart hallelujah then a negative person always negative always you know looking at things and complaining and i've seen some christian like that you probably know some christian like that you got to pray for them and then that time you got to correct them so you need to listen to yourself uh, it could be a husband and wife and one of the spouses are very negative maybe the other spouse say you always negative and you're supposed to be a person of faith you're supposed to be a person that trusts god's word and sometimes people don't even realize how negative they are they've been doing it all their life and nobody held them accountable you know uh, they do it for attention or they do it because they just like, you know, being negative. No, I don't want to be negative. Hallelujah. I want to have the word of God in my mouth. And I know you want to have the word of God coming out of your mouth. Now, how can you begin to channel negative emotions in a manner that avoids displaying the character of a fool? See, you got to check yourself. Sometimes we always want to look at others, but we got to check ourselves. How can I make sure that when a negative emotion come up, I don't start going down the road of a fool, acting like a fool? I'm talking to Christians now. Those negative emotions are real. It's part of the human nature. You can't, that, that's not the devil. That's why people ain't never, that's why people don't deal with themselves. They throw it off on the devil. You mad at somebody talking about that old devil. That ain't the devil, that's you. That's a negative emotion. You identify it, then you catch yourself and you ask the Holy Spirit to help you to channel this negative emotion in a way that you will reflect the character of Christ and not the character of a fool. All right. Another one is what disciplines can you begin to practice in order to be a better listener? And, you know, listening is a skill. Yes. The Bible tells us in James to be slow to speak, but quick to listen, slow to wrath. Listening is a skill and you have to intentionally start practicing that skill. And some of us are just talkers. You know, that's just our personality. Well, we have to begin to work on how can I be a better listener? In other words, when you're talking to someone, intentionally tell yourself, now I'm going to focus all my attention on what this person is saying. I'm going to be engaged. Matter of fact, I'm going to say back to them something that they said to let them know that I'm engaged and listening to them and I am taking what they're saying as valuable. Listen, if you are married, if you, if, if, if you are married, you know you have to practice this in that marriage. If not, boy, when you're talking to your spouse, all of a sudden they'll throw up their hands and say, I can't get a word in. You won't let me say nothing. And then you wonder, what's wrong with her? What's wrong with him? You're not a good listener and you need to start practicing it. And the best place to begin is, first of all, in prayer with God. Hallelujah. Sit there and be quiet and listen to the Lord. Then start practicing it if you're married with your spouse. Then practice it with your children and then take it into the workplace and practice it there. And you'll find out that you are developing what? Good listening skills. You can hear people, but you may not be listening. And we want to be good listeners. We have some announcements this Friday. Join me for the Leaders Corner. All Leaders Word Alive. Make sure you tune in. If not, you go back look at it later on YouTube or Facebook. But we want you to be uh, engaged in what we're speaking relative to Christian leadership. And this coming Sunday, oh, we're excited about it. Oh man, the vision of our church. Uh, we uh, we are here for spiritual cultivation. Uh, I mean, loving, caring, creating great commission moments in our life. And that's what we're about. We're about building up, equipping saints so that what? So that we can reflect the love of the Lord Jesus in the world and among one another. And so that we can be like Jesus with that woman at the well. We can go through our normal day and look for opportunity for God to create great commission experiences 
in our life. That's soul winning, reaching the lost. That's the heart of God, and that should be the heart of the church. Well, we're excited about the vision that we have here at Word Alive Church, and that vision is coming to pass in the midst of a pandemic. That vision has not stopped. It is going forward. And I want to thank you for being faithful to that vision. And as we get ready to celebrate this first Sunday, this is our financial, deceit, uh, financial discipleship Sunday, and Word Alive know what that is. Glory, that ain't no fundraiser. That ain't no, you know, match my giving all, oh, but that's because we've set our heart on the kingdom of God and we set our heart on making sure that we are honoring God with our wealth. We are making sacrificial giving a joy and a delight, not a burden, but a blessing in the name of Jesus. And so our successful singles, uh, remember February the 13th, we're looking to engage with you all and also our two-in-one marriage ministry on February the 14th. We're in, looking forward to engaging with you all. Have a great day in the wonderful name of Jesus and walk in the wisdom that is from above, that is peacefully, that is pure and easily to be entreated. That is the wisdom of the Almighty God. God bless you. Have a great day.